And the path I was on was 1,000% that it'll kill you in four to six weeks. Um, when it goes all your organs, especially your heart, it'll just completely make your heart shut down. And so, yeah, you know, I was out there and I, I was in the VA hospital. And the third day I attempted to leave. I was like, hey, doc, what do you think about me going home and resting and coming back every day? And he's like, sit the fuck down. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, if you would, let me, he's like, I wasn't trying to scare you before and I don't want to scare you. But if you would have stayed out there for one to two more days longer, there's a very good chance you could have just died out there. Your heart just getting completely stopped on you. I was like, that's the moment that I realized like, wow, like know your body be able to push your body and train in as many situations as you can, but at the same time, listen to your body. Because if I was to go out there and just be stubborn, like my son wouldn't have a dad to raise him. Mm-hmm. These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. So... What's the origin story? How did you get this way? <laughs> Why am I the way I am? Why are you so weird, Mark? <laughs> That's a hard question to answer. Let's see. Man, even growing up, I, I mean, first off, there's nothing special about me, but I like, uh, I grew up, I was definitely the black sheep in my family. No one in my family hunts. Not one of them. Um, they fish, but they're all from like Florida and city slickers and I'm not the biggest country boy out there, but I'm sure as heck no city slicker. They don't really shoot guns. Um, I grew up with my buddy Quint and he, you know, when I met him at 10 years old, going to the hunting club and it was a totally different type of hunting than what I'm used to now, but like East coast, uh, stand hunting, using feeders, pigs, turkey, whitetail. That was about all I grew up on. And then it wasn't until I was like, Oh, I don't know. Uh, 22 when I joined the Marine Corps. Um, 22? And, yep, joined the Marine Corps, 22. Um, I always knew I wanted to join the military. I just mm-hmm. didn't know what I wanted to do. And when I was like 20 years old in Texas Roadhouse, flipping burgers, and my manager comes up to me. He's an awesome guy, good friends with him, and he was like, hey, Mark, I want to make you the kitchen manager. And I was like, hey, Luke, I quit felt really bad but I quit like right then and there because I was like that is not gonna be the story of my life nothing against nothing wrong with it just wasn't gonna be the story of my life so I quit and I immediately like started working out because I was like 160 pounds soaking wet six foot two and skinny and I told my buddy I was like we need to go figure out what we're gonna do so we started searching online we're like what's sweet what's bad to the bone what's awesome (laughs) right and got these pictures of force recon coming up and out of the water and I was like that's what we need to do so we trained for two years. He lost 100 pounds. I gained 60. And then uh, we both went in the Marine Corps. Uh, went through the reconnaissance corps, passed it, got into the units. And then he's still in. Um, I got separated after about a little more than nine years mm-hmm. uh, for my hearing. And it was while I was in the Marine Corps, stationed in Bridgeport, California, where I really started like realizing what hunting on the west coast was and what is bridgeport like what happens at bridgeport yeah so bridgeport's the mountain cold weather training center for the marine corps developed around the korean war we lost so many casualties to cold weather injuries and stuff like that and 
it's located just south of Lake Tahoe okay. in the Sierra Nevadas. And man, I mean, it's just an amazing place. It's God's country for sure. Mm-hmm. Like going up there and being able to have worked up there for four years was awesome. Um, you get a lot of snow. Yeah, you get a lot of snow. You get some the temperatures dip down to the negative twenties routinely. Mm-hmm. Um, so cold weather and definitely a lot of snow. Uh, but I mean, I didn't work a day from you know 2012. So right now I haven't worked a day in my life for the last, you know, nine years. So it's been a blessing for sure. But I ran the Mountain Scott Sniper course and then the Mountain Survival course while I was up there. Uh, ran into some great people. Uh, Keith Parker, uh, Jerry Saunders, Survival World, Shooting World. Uh, and then, yeah, from there, uh, went to Second Recon uh, at Camp Lejeune. Mm-hmm. Got out in 2017, started my own business teaching shooting and survival. And I wasn't even supposed to teach shooting. I was supposed to teach just survival. Right. The business name, International Mountain Survival, doesn't really have any shooting in it. And uh, I started getting phone calls from a lot of law enforcement officers that had been through the high angle sniper course. And they're like, hey, can you do another one? And I was like, yeah, sure. And then I realized, hey, that's where the market is and that's what the people want. So that's what I gave them. So um, I kind of started up what's called the the woodsman high angle course where it's combining long range shooting uh mixed with bushcraft survival skills whatever you want to call it um and that's kind of been my bread and butter as far as with my business and then in 2018 i was lucky enough to have a buddy uh who worked who uh owns a pack station up in the sierras and he was like hey you need to come to this place and check it out as far as instructing there and he was talking about Branded Rock Canyon. And so I went, I came here and I saw this place for the first time and I was like, this is insane. Like it's got just the terrain, right? And oh, the it's, of, it's unbelievable. And the amount of targets we have here and the type of targets. And, and so it didn't have a lot of structure to it, but it had everything necessary for an amazing shooting program. And so they were like, hey, would you like to instruct here? I was like, uh would you have me is more like the question, right? Cause I, I think anybody would love to instruct here. And, yeah. and we're, we're at Branded Rock Canyon right now. Um, we're just outside of Debec. Is that how yeah, you say Debec, it? Yeah. Debec, Colorado. Um, beautiful ranch, big ranch and incredible lodge facility here and really interesting terrain. Um, and then you've got a bunch of different shooting ranges. There's hunting here, there's fishing here. Um, this is like a, I don't know, a luxury ranch. I I don't even know how to describe it because there isn't, there isn't this thing in other places. This is a unique, a unique place. Yeah. It's super unique. It's a, it's an outdoor Mecca for sure. When it comes to like different activities and stuff you can do, but it's the, you know, besides the lodge and how nice it is with all the luxurious accommodations and stuff like that. Besides that, it's the terrain that you wake up in the morning, you look outside and you're like, wow, where am I? Um, the steep canyons, the animal life, the wildlife that's here. I mean, it's just pretty insane. But, you know, you, I've watched some videos on the place, and it didn't really do it justice until I came here and saw it in person. You start driving down the driveway, and it's a five-mile-long driveway, and you're like, whoa, what am I getting myself into with all the artwork and stuff? But, yeah, so I came here and started instructing in 2018 and uh, 2000, the end of 2000. 19 when i got off alone um i was like hey you, I'll, I'll run this shooting program if you'd like and they're like let's do it so i started running the shoot, shooting program um the end of 2019 and i'm still here i feel pretty good about that too because the program director position that i currently am at like they rotate through it pretty often mm-hmm. so i'm like the longest standing program director here at branded rock so nice yeah <laughs> i take that well, there, there's I'll a couple it. there's a couple things here that that I want to go back to before we go too much farther into Branded Rock. Um, you were involved with the Combat Hunter Program in the Marine Corps. Yeah, man, super cool program. Yeah, um, highly underutilized, underappreciated. This is something that I think kept a lot of Marines alive, even with very limited exposure to it. Talk me through what the Combat Hunter Program was. 
Yeah, so back in 2006, General Mattis uh, saw that military personnel did not have the skill sets that they used to have back in the day when it came to um, just being situationally aware of certain things. So what he did is he wanted to develop a program that made Marines more aware. Um, he wanted to be proactive rather than reactive in uh, modern-day warfare, right? So as far as looking out for IEDs, um, trying to spot uh, a sniper position before you're hit from a sniper, things like this, are, and it's mostly the IEDs um, that he was trying to mitigate as much as possible. So he brought in an observations or a uh, expert in observation. Um, he brought in an expert f for profiling, and then he brought in an expert for tracking. Um, Ian Carter, Greg Williams, and David Scott Donlin. Um, so these were the three experts in profiling as a hunter. Uh, Ian Carter, Ian, Car Ian Carter, Ivan Carter, Ivan, Ivan Carter. I'm saying Ian. Yep. Um, People might know him from all of the, like the anti-poaching initiatives that he's constantly doing in Africa. He's yeah. a real advocate for uh, for wildlife in, in a bunch of different countries in Africa. Yeah. And so these three guys came in and pretty much shaped what Combat Hunter was supposed to be, what they were looking for. Um, and that happened in 2006. I remember going through one of the real early programs in 2008. Uh, and then... I went, I went through a couple more times while I was in the Marine Corps, but, uh, you know, combat hunter was a program that invaluable to have as far as teaching you what to look for, how to look for getting into tracking and all three of them are really a type of observation, whether you're profiling, mm -hmm. you got to be able to use your eyes. And when I say profiling, I mean like combat profiling, people hear the word profiling and they get their panties in a wad. Because they're like, oh, you're racial profiling. I'm like, no, that's not what I said at all. Uh, combat profiling is completely different. It, it definitely keeps people alive. Um, so that means that we're looking at people's body language, their complexion, whether they're sweating, how, how they're moving their hands, what their eyes are doing, you know, taking in everything about that person and their behavior and then trying to understand what they're actually up to. Yeah, absolutely. The, the kinesics or the body motion communication what that body is saying because people will say a heck of a lot more with their body and uh, than they will with their mouth, especially in a hostile environment. So they're not going to talk to you, but they are talking to you. Um, they just don't know it. Um, and then as well as the entire atmosphere, right? Uh, atmospheres, uh, geographics, iconography, flags, uh, what's written. So there, everything tells a picture um, and you can build that picture to essentially like, be able to fight wars more, more proactively mm -hmm. and keep our troops safer. Oh yeah. And so people that, that we knew we needed combat hunter back then, um, when the budget start cuts start happening, everything, um, I was lucky to, to have ran, uh, the West coast for a few months. I ran it, um, camp Pendleton 2018. Amazing time. Absolutely loved it. Um, I couldn't stand living in Southern California, so I couldn't keep working there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the the East Coast Combat Hunter, they were doing things a little bit differently than the West Coast. The West Coast is where it started. The East Coast was definitely um, not becoming stagnant. They were constantly learning, and they were uh, changing the period of instruction. Whereas the West Coast, you know, the contractors just got into their – groove and then they didn't want to change anything up and they weren't really giving out new information as a uh, as things evolved but you know the sad thing is is that they've recently got rid of the combat hunter program so as of february the end of february of this year 2021 there will be no combat hunter and uh you know when that when that news got to me i was pretty i was pretty upset because i know the value that that program holds but, you know, the guys that are teaching it now, I'm sure they'll be able to start their own. And some of them are, have already started their own branch. Um, just not going to be called Combat Hunter. Sure. But one yeah. of the elements that after operating in an IED environment, I wish had been more of a part of Combat Hunter training is trapping. I think that trappers have a very unique skill that 
um, really helps you understand IED emplacement. So when you're trapping, you're predicting to within a square inch where an animal is going to step. In order to do that, you have to understand the normal operating procedure for, for that animal. Okay, it's coyote, fox, beaver, whatever. Um, but you have to do it so precisely that you say, okay, he's going to step right here. And it's not good enough to just guess that because nobody's that good. So you manipulate that environment in subtle ways that feel natural that make him step on that spot. And looking back, like that's exactly the way IED emplacement worked. And it could be as simple as putting, you know, a, a rock on the side of the road. It's like, yeah, you're not going to hit that rock with your tire, right? You're going to deviate. You're, you're going to go a little bit to the left. And it's like, okay, now I just controlled this vehicle's pattern of movement and made it predictable by altering this environment in a really subtle way. And I think that if Marines had to spend a little bit of time thinking about how they would put a trap in the ground, that they would immediately understand that that is how the game is getting played against them. So, you know, learning to not let something like that dictate your behavior and your movement and understanding that um, you cannot be predictable. So think about just giving up on plan A because plan A is the plan that makes sense. So now if you move to plan B, like who's going to do the, the second best plan? Like that's very, very difficult to predict. So you've obviously given something up, but um, yeah, it was a tremendous program and it, it had a lot of promise and I hope that it gets replaced by something even better than what it was. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. But you started hunting as a kid and then you got into the Marine Corps and learned a lot about shooting, right? Um, being a sniper and recon, you're going to learn a lot about shooting when it matters, like stakes are high. And then getting out and now doing shooting instruction and tailoring a lot of that towards hunters. Um, how do you feel like that, that evolution of learning or that, that curve ha has affected you? Did, did hunting as a kid help you become a better recon sniper? Did being a recon sniper help you become a better hunter now that you're out of the Marine Corps? Did any of it make you worse? You know, I think, yeah, you know, I always tell people, like, the Marine Corps didn't shape me into who I was. It just, it helped add to who I was. Um, but even before that, you know, before the Marine Corps, you're done being shaped by a certain age, right? And and you're on that path. I'm not saying people can't change, but I was already had that mindset of hunting 24-7, going out, enjoying nature, right? Being out on the mountainside or in the, in the woods, on the East coast is it, but you know, I joined the military thinking that 200 yards was a long shot. And it was in Florida, 200 yards is a real long shot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh the terrain dictates how far you can see out there and, um, went through some training and then realized, okay, now we're shooting a thousand yards, right? That was a pretty standard distance, thousand meters. The more that I shot and the more than I instructed, the more I started realizing, you know, because there's this perception that nowadays that we can shoot animals at an extreme distance and people have kind of set these numbers and I'm not here, here to set numbers of what I think is right. But what I am going to say is that a lot more people are shooting outside of their ability zone, mm -hmm. not necessarily guns ability. The gun can do it, but as far as the shooter's ability, as far as calling wind, or predicting that animal's movement, um, a lot of shooters are kind of getting a little bit carried away. So what I've learned is through going from a civilian hunting life to the military back to the civilian is really taking a humbling step backwards towards reality. Um, you know, with, with my background in shooting, I'd say that I know, I, I hope I know what I'm doing when it comes to long range shooting and stuff. Right. Um, but I won't, I base how far I'll shoot an animal based off of wind and my abilities to call wind. And that changes drastically, whether that's here in Colorado on the ranch I've always shot at that I mm -hmm. can learn the wind systems to, okay, now I go to Kentucky, rolling hills, um, and you know, totally different wind systems. And it's the first time out there. I'm not going to be able to read wind out there like I can here. So, 
my distance also changes and comes in a lot closer um, depending on the conditions. But, you know, shooting, we've made it so complicated in the last, like, 10 years. We started adding all this stuff, and in reality, like, sometimes just going out there with just a rifle, you know, and the knowledge you have in your head. And, you know, now that we have mills or minutes that we can do holds with first focal plane scopes, that's that's amazing because now we don't even have to dial, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and for certain applications, that's great. Um, so being able to go out there, get in a good sitting position and shoot a target at 350 yards, um, that's something that a lot of people can't do nowadays. But they can go out there and shoot at 800 yards from the sitting with a tripod with a bag in the back and everything. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but most of the time in hunting situations, most of the time, not all the time, you're not afforded a lot of time. Right. So, you know, I think uh, one of the things when the students come through my courses now, they're thinking that I'm going to teach them how to shoot a thousand yards. This is what I did in the military. They're te- thinking I'm going to teach them how to shoot 1500 yards. And I'm like, absolutely not. I'm going to teach you how to shoot the best of your abilities based off of how accurate you can call wind. And so they they hear that and they're like, oh, well, that's no fun, right? But um, first round impacts is is where I'm at. I wish I did more competitions. I don't. Um, I just don't have the time right now, honestly. But I wish I did. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad I don't because mm-hmm. it gives me, it keeps me in the box of reality, in my opinion. Um, I'm all, when I do train, I'm always training for one shot engagements and obviously you always follow it up with a second good shot but that first shot needs to be a solid shot not a miss not a spotting shot on a rock 50 yards to the right trying to figure out your elevation there, there shouldn't be any of that going on i'm not saying it hasn't been done before but you know you should be able to take one shot on an animal and every shot that you place that you know that you're going to ethically put it down so the distance caliber plays a big role Wind speed plays a big role. Your ability is wind speed, what equipment you have. So so if I have a 10-inch plate and I snatch you up and take you to some place that you've never been, okay, bag over the head, you're in a van, it's creepy, and say, all right, Mark, you are betting $1,000 that you're going to hit this 10-inch plate. What's the farthest distance out that it's going to be? And you don't know the conditions that you're going to be shooting in. What's the furthest? Yeah. Oh, I'm already thinking like 500. But even then, if it's going to be, I would know that 500 is going to be one of my max distances, right? And we'll take that $1,000 bet and we'll raise it to 10,000, right? This is something like, oh, this could make a significant difference. Like, this is a big deal. Um, and, I mean, I guess 1,000 is too. It all depends. 1,000 <laughs> <laughs> is too. 1,000 not nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I was a look at it and I go, okay, 10 inches means I got five inches off the left and five inches off the right. Now, if I have a half minute of angle gun, that's already two and a half inches to the left and two and a half inches to the right where that round can hit anywhere within that, right? Yep. Um, So now I'm left with like two and a half inches possibly. And I don't like that, right? I like having uh, as big of a kill zone as possible. So Yeah, so 500 yards, if if you miss your wind call by two miles an hour, um, you just missed 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And calling wind within two miles an hour, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. Something that's constantly changing. Um, it's, you, you know, you can read Mirage, but even Mirage from the second you pull the trigger to the second it hits the target, um, it's changing. Now it's not this mythical made up thing. Like wind is, um, we know how much wind drift there is for certain distances and certain calibers and certain velocities and, but with certain ballistic coefficients, but we are always making our best estimated guess of what that wind's doing. And so, you know, for me to sit here and say 500, a thousand dollars. Yeah. I've missed targets that are 10 inches at 500. Absolutely. I've missed coyotes at a hundred stinking meters before. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so for me to sit there and say that I've never missed an animal at a close range like that, You learn every time you miss, but I also, through a lot of missing um, and a lot of hitting and a lot of training and a lot of watching other students, have set these distances for myself based off of what I think is right for myself. Yep. And so I feel confident, yeah, it would be right around that mark, 500 on a 10-inch plate. And then if the winds are gusting, 
more than four miles an hour in between gusts, I mean, I'm looking, that might be drop. That's going to drop down into 400. Mm -hmm. And these are like close ranges. People are probably listening to and going 400. That's nothing, but it's not 400 yards. That bullet can do a lot of different things. Yeah. You know, we're mountain goat hunting in Kodiak this year, and we're consistently dealing with wind that was 30 to 40 miles an hour. (laughs) And (laughs) In, in basins, right, coming through crags and the rocks and, like, weird wind, wind that's tough to call. And at 30 miles an hour, boy, oh, boy, uh, you want to get closer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that 400-yard shot with a 30-mile-an-hour wind that's going back and forth between, you know, 25 and 35 all the time, and it's swirling. It's not coming from just a laminar wind coming from left to right. That's a tough call, super tough call. Yeah. But I think that, you know, people need to figure out what their max distance is in a controlled environment where they're on their, their home range, they're a hero, they know the wind, um, they've got a good solid rest, and they're hitting that target 100% of the time, every time, exactly where they want to hit it. And then they need to take a bunch off that, and then that's going to be their max range in the field where they're tired and there's, you know, all these unknown elements that are bothering their shot. So, you know, if you're King Kong and you can hit 500 yards steel on the, on the course every time, that might mean that you're like a 300 yard shooter, yeah. um, in the field and 300 yards isn't nothing in the field. You know, people miss, miss a lot, um, easier shots than that on a yeah. consistent basis. And so. most of the time when they when people are on ranges doing, you know, hitting these 500 yard shots, right. On these gongs or targets or whatever. They're just relaxed. They're sitting there. They didn't just get done hiking up a hill, glassing, breathing heavy, yeah. excited. They got the rush going through their body. Um, you know, and then we start getting into, hey, we're not shooting from the prone anymore. We're mm-hmm. probably off a pack, off a tripod. A rock. A rock, a tree. It's wiggling around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, then you're you're stressed because you think that animal is going to run away soon, which it probably is. You know, there's <laughs> a lot of factors. Yeah. So. Okay, I want to ask you about um, angle shooting because this is something that I feel like there is a lot of bad information out there about. Um, and you do a lot of high angle shots here. And at what degree would you consider a shot high angle to start with? Well, technically, high angle is anything above like 40 degrees. 40 degrees. Yeah, which that's pretty steep. 40 is extremely steep. So that's what they consider high angle. So it's funny because the Mountain Warfare Training Center uh, – the high angle sniper course, the max you get out there is like 29 degrees. Mm-hmm. So it should be like the mountain high wind course. Cause you get a lot higher winds. I've seen 80 mile an hour winds out there before, which is just ridiculous. Obviously anything above 40 miles an hour, I'm not even going to try and train guys in. Right. Mm-hmm. But you know, as far as steepness goes, anything after 15 degrees, like, and it all depends on distance too. So certain distance, but I always, account for angle because I don't have to anymore, right? With a SIG Kilo, a 2400 or the 2200, like they're automatically accounting for it. Yep. So, you know, it's funny because, you know, back in 2012, I was still teaching guys how to use angle cosine indicators and do the math and multiply the cosine times the range. And you're trying to, and you're milling out targets and you're trying to get the targets um, flat line distance, not the actual distance but the flat line or the, or the horizontal distance because that's the distance that gravity is actually affecting the round wind is affecting it the entire which is your line of sight so your actual distance wind wind affects your projectile that way but as far as gravity it's only affected on the flat line so back then we would do the cosine formula to try and get that flat line distance and in order to make precise shots we were always no matter what doing it right Um, but if I had to engage quickly, multiple target engagements, right? You can, you can go out there and you can put your, you can put your max point blank on your scope. And I know I can reach, Hey, from zero out to 300, I can hit this size target, or you can put a 300 yard dope on there and know that, Hey, from 200 out to 450, I can hit this size target. Let's define max point blank real quick. So your point blank You've, you've got this line of sight, like there's a laser coming out your barrel. Yep. And your scope is actually angling down through that line of sight. So your point blank range is the first point where the path of the bullet crosses what you're looking through 
at the scope, right? No. No? So with max point blank, like... Well, any, and then max point blank is where it intersects again. And then max ordinate is the highest point in between. No. Okay, so what's point blank? So max point blank is if I was to set my turret, say at 100 yards zero, how low am I going to be able to hit it, right? So how far out can I shoot and still hit it as far as hitting it low? And how close can I be and still hit it? So given the size of your so, target. Yeah, so say we're, we got a target at 300 and it's a 10-inch plate and I'm zeroed at 100. Well, let's say that I've got, I don't know, eight inches of drop at 300, right? We'll say I got two inches of drop at 200 and then eight inches of drop at 300. If it has eight inches of drop on a 10 inch target, I'm gonna miss three inches off that target. So I know my max point blank isn't gonna work for that. But if it was five inches of drop, I might hit right at the base of it. So if I, if I was hitting right at the base, okay, good. I can hit my max point blank with a zero dope. I can hit from zero all the way out to 300. Now let's say I put my 300 yard dope on. Now I'm eight inches high. Well, I can hit this target probably from 150 all the way to 350. Does that make sense? So now mm -hmm. um, I have the ability to put a, essentially a combat dope on my gun, right? And that combat dope, I'm able to just put that, my turrets, wherever I, I think that most of my engagements are going to be taking place. And this is mostly for military operations, obviously. Law enforcement and hunters would never use this. Well, we did a lot in the duplex days, right? Guys oh, yep. guys that side yep. in three inches high at 100 and they're, you know, hold on the hair, hope in the heart until and, and 300. We, and, we, and I should take that back because, yeah, yeah, we still do it. I literally just taught a class with uh, some kids that this is what they had to work with. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, sweet. We're going to zero your gun at 300. They're like, why 300? I'm like, because we can get all the way out from zero out to um, 350, I think. 400, we had to make a minor change. Right. And then 500 was one hold. And we were able to do that. You know, they have the thick stadiums. It's not just an exact crosshair, but it's a duplex. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were able to have three different holds with that, but you know, for precise shots nowadays, luckily we don't have to do that anymore. Right. But you know, law enforcement officer where they have to, they have to hit that target is I consider that like hunting. You have to hit in that kill zone for law enforcement it's the T box, right. And the headshot, um, you're not really shooting people in the chest. Most situations in law enforcement, um, military, <laughs> who cares? Like, right. Like it all depends on what we're doing, but most of the time it's get rounds on, on target. Yeah. Neutralize and destroy. Yeah. And for hunting, it is the same thing. So when I look at max point blank, it does have its place in the hunting world when we haven't updated our equipment or we're using stuff that, uh, is our grandfather's rifle scope or whatever. And honestly, like a lot of that's, I've seen hunters go out there with a, duplex radical and they're more successful than a guy with a ten thousand dollar rifle with a four thousand dollar optic on there and that's just because they know all they have to do is go out there and pull the trigger and they're going to hit the target somewhere in there mm -hmm. and some people overthink things when it comes to long range shooting we were talking earlier For like sure. if it's 300 yards pretty much one mil pull yep. the sink and trigger like you'll you'll hit in the kill zone of an animal um but just having that baseline knowledge um, is what a lot of hunters have kind of gotten away from. A lot of little shooters, I should say. But yeah, so for, for max point blank, um, and then max ord is the highest that round is going to be mm -hmm. in that projectile's flight. Um, the max ordinate of that round. So if you've got like, I don't know, 20, 20 inches of drop, it'll be 20 inches your, your max ord of that round. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so one of the factors with angle shooting is that wind is no longer just moving from left to right. Wind is also moving vertically. Yeah. And how does that affect a bullet in the real world? Yeah. So it's, it's funny, like people will take these, uh, these weather meters and stuff and different ballistic softwares and everything. And they'll look at it and they'll go, they'll put it in wind into their algorithm and they'll see, Oh, my elevation just changed. And so, um, you're talking about dynamic jump. Some people call it, uh, wind jump. Some people call it dynamic jump. So my understanding is that if you've got a wind from like a two o'clock, three o'clock position, 
and you have a right hand twist on your rifling that your bullet is not going to drop as fast as if that wind was coming basically from the left. I don't know. I'd have to look at it and I'd have to think about this because this, this is this type of thing that always confuses me because not only, because I'll do this with left to right winds, but how much it actually affects it is null and void for hunting situations. So I don't apply that. Uh, for hunting, I'm never going to add that in because I'm only shooting out to a certain distance. But right. if I am trying to shoot out to a thousand and beyond, absolutely I'll think about this. In your rangefinder, like if you're using a SIG rangefinder, it's doing this for you. The applied ballistic software yep. is going to do this for yep. you if you've changed um, the angle of the wind. A lot of people put in 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock and they just leave it there. But if you actually change that setting in your rangefinder to what the wind is actually doing, then it's going to make that elevation adjustment. But what if the wind is uh, blowing uphill or downhill? So, yeah. So with wind left to right, depending on, because our bullets are spinning to the right. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have any left-hand twists for the most part. So since it's spinning to the right, um, when the wind's coming from the left or from the right, you will see it make the round go higher or lower. Um, When the winds are coming at the bullet, depending on the terrain, if it's a flat range, you're really not going to see much. But if you have a hillside and you're shooting at that hillside and you've got a 6 to 12 wind coming from your rear going towards your target and it is, let's say, 10 miles an hour, the faster it is, the more it builds off that wall, right? So if it's hitting that wall, it's going to start going up. It's got to go somewhere. It's going to go to the sides, but it's also going to go up. Mm-hmm. And that's how what you call orographic uplift. The faster it's going, the more it's going to build out, the more it's going to affect your projectile, essentially raising your projectile, right? And you will be hitting high. So with orographic uplift, um, a lot of times if you're shooting, like sometimes I'll be shooting at a mile or or a thousand yards. And what I've seen most is I've seen it with uh, like 30 mile an hour winds and the right terrain, almost a 0.8 mil difference. Mm. That's a lot. Very significant. Yeah, as, as a, and you're like, what is going on with my data? Nothing makes sense. And then you start realizing, oh, it's these wind systems. Um, and so when I start seeing things like, okay, well, how do you predict or graphic uplift? And you're like, you can't. You kind of just have to know that area. You got to know those wind systems. You got to see, okay, it's blowing four miles an hour. It's 600 yards. Is it really going to make that big of a difference? Probably not. Okay, it's blowing four miles an hour. It's 1,000 yards. Is it going to make that big of a difference? Probably so. Um, you might have to take 0.1, 0.2 mils off, but as you know, with the size targets we shoot at 0.2 mils, that could be the difference between a, a hit or a miss for sure at a thousand. And so it's knowing your environment and being humble enough to say, Hey, should I take that shot or should I probably try and get closer? You know, cause you've got or graphic uplift, which is that it's coming up. Then you've also got it coming down. So if it's coming you know, if you're up on top of a mountain and it's coming over your back and pushing down, those wind systems are pushing down too. And they're taking the path of least resistance and they're going downwards in the downward direction a lot of times. If it's coming up, it's going to come up towards you, pushing you around up. If it's coming from behind you and you're on top of the hills, um, it'll push you around down. And you got to compensate for that too. And so it's your best estimated guess because there is no like formula out there for saying, okay, well, if it's four miles an hour, because every terrain feature is different. And depending on how high that terrain feature, if it's a cliff, if, uh, if it's thin, if it's thick, as far as a mountainside, um, depends on how those winds are going to flow. But, you know, people always say like winds flow a lot like water and they do. I've just heard it too much, but yeah. Yeah. There's, some really key differences between yeah. wind and, and water. And I think it's an oversimplification yep. and it, it makes people maybe more familiar than, uh, than they ought to be. Magnus effect, the Magnus effect. That's the thing I'm sorry. So we were talking about okay. the left and right, uh, coming from the left and right. And so, you know, the Magnus effect is really what we're looking at. Uh, w- the projectile in motion mm-hmm. or the force, a wind hitting it from the opposite direction. Um, it's either going to cause it to go up or down. So if you guys look up the Magnus effect, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, but you know, for shooting out of helicopters for the longest time, uh, we would say right, right, low, left, left, high, um, or right, right, high, left, left, low. I can't remember right now, but, um, it was back in the day I'm shooting out of birds, but regardless what it means is if I'm shooting on the right side of a bird, I need to aim to the right 
and I need to aim high or low, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm shooting, and that's to compensate for the direction of movement, but they would also, and I'm like, okay, well, what's the elevation for? And they would say, oh, it's for the rotor wash of the bird. And I'm like, okay. And then I started talking to a guy named uh, Dr. Lyman Hazleton, and he was like, no, that's ridiculous. Absolutely not. I mean, think about how much the rotor wash, it's like 10 meters. Right. And I was like, oh, yeah, it totally makes sense. And he's like, and as fast as your bolts in flight, he's like, this is from the Magnus effect, and you're going 50 knots. Mm -hmm. That's drastic. Yeah. That's a 50-mile-an-hour wind. Um, and so, you know, the, the Magnus effect um, plays a big role when you're in a moving, when you are the moving vehicle or you're, you're in a moving platform and you're trying to make that wind call. But also with winds, it's the same thing with heavy winds. So it will affect um, their elevation of your round. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you go from this, this world of literal rocket science, trying to understand you know, how a projectile is behaving in, in these d dynamic and complex environments that, you know, all you have is your optics to look down there and try and guess what the wind is doing based on what you're seeing. Go from that to taking out a stick bow to try and <laughs> ma make your living with it. Um, on the Alone show, you were on season seven of Alone. Yeah. 44 days. Yeah, man. That was, that was a tough deal. Yeah, it, it was uh, it was awesome though. I'm always trying to push myself, and uh, you know, and I kind of got that itch when I was at Bridgeport, right, doing this, teaching the survival courses and everything, and that's when I developed a passion for. It. But I do have a passion for teaching long range shooting. But when it comes to hunting, I mean, there's there's nothing better than stalking, all right, stalking up on your on your prey and getting close and taking it with a more primitive means just means a little bit more to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I mean, that, that's the same thing as like, I'll take a muzzle loader out, like muzzle loader. Like I'd love h hunting with muzzle loaders. Like I want to take one of these Flint, uh, smooth bores, right? I want to take an old, a bat, old Bess out there and, and do some hunting with it. But like, I'm not, I, that's not going to happen right now, but I do like hunting more primitively. Um, and so going on that show kind of, it was the time that I got to like, Hey, start training with a stick bow i had done some traditional bow shooting a little bit growing up but nothing serious right right um you're not betting a million dollars on it heck no like yeah. my life wasn't dependent on it. i wasn't have to feed myself with it and it went from hey you're gonna go on this show would you like to i was like yeah They're like all right well you got a month and a half to get ready for it and i was like all right so roger that. How, do you know where you're going at that point so we do, you know, okay. they, they do tell the contestants, uh, like a general region where they're going, you get mm -hmm. to study, um, that general region, but you get a month and a half. So really a month and a half, if you don't know what you're doing, that's going to show real quick, no matter, even if you had a year, right. And started training. And one of the biggest things I started doing was shooting my traditional bow because mm -hmm. man, I sucked. Mm -hmm. I picked this thing up and I had a 50 pound draw weight and it was a, a reflex deflex um, bow that I had made and I didn't go full recurve. I didn't want to go traditional. So I picked a reflex deflex right in the middle and I slowly, I, well, I sucked and I sucked bad. And I mean, I, I couldn't even hit a kill zone at 10 yards. I'm like all over the place. And, uh, I just kept honing my skills and honing my skills and every single day going out there shooting it. And i have this mindset of shooting precise. Mm -hmm. I love shooting precise. And when I went out there with this traditional bow and that was not happening i was like how do i make myself better so then i had to start asking the experts right hey getting advice from all of them how to shoot better and i started figuring out little things that i was doing um, to make myself more effective as a as a hunter because i didn't necessarily have to kill a moose with this bow i had to be able to kill squirrels with this bow right, right. <laughs> like the things that are definitely going to be in front of my face i need to be able to take down rabbits squirrels um grouse yep grouse and trees anything so by the time I went out there a month and a half of just practicing religiously and not getting to the point of diminishing return when you're out there training, you're shooting too much and it's not doing any good, but like stopping every day and doing a little bit each day. Um, I was out there competing with some of the best bowyers that make bows like uh, organic archer. Um, and you know, I was like, all right, feeling pretty confident with, cause he, that guy can shoot a mm -hmm. traditional bow. And, uh, you know, I just felt good about it after getting out there. So now it's a hobby that I can't put down. Right. I mean, I love it. 
It's super fun. It is. Yeah. yeah. What else did you do to prepare? So going out on that show, I, the first one of the first things I did, started doing was shoot my bow. The next thing I started making a lot of gill nets. Mm-hmm. I knew that I, I was going to make a gill net while I was out there, and I was going to. I didn't want to bring one. I just wanted to make one out of five fifty cord. So I did that. I uh, I wanted to measure out exactly how much five fifty cord I was going to need. Mm-hmm. So and then I started making my shelter. I made must have made my shelter at least three times. Different methods for making my shelter. In the show, it doesn't show me making my shelter. Which kind of does me some justice because it was a shit show, man. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> if you guys would have seen me trying to put up that wall, I like built it on the ground and then I stood it up for my last wall. And it, I mean, it was this thing where you have to adapt and figure it out, right? Um, but it was not pretty. I had the thing fall over when I was setting up my initial setup. It fell over a couple times and, you know, I just kept a smile on my face and I was like, ah. Whatever, it's on camera, right? Yeah. I figured they'd show it, but they didn't show it. But I'll, I'll still talk about it. Um, there was a lot of failure in putting that shelter up. But by the time I got it up, I knew that I wouldn't have been able to do that without training that I had done previously. Because I had done it a few times. Yeah. And I knew that it could be done. So, uh, you know, let's see. What else to do? Uh, oh, making lures. I made a lot of lures mm-hmm. out of uh, antlers and whatever I could find. Shiny things, Coke bottles. I was really relying on finding some coke bottles Mm -hmm. there was zero no trash on that where i was at i mean there was just nothing like some guys were finding like hot tubs right right and i was well not hot tubs you turned into a hot tub an old boat yeah but uh i found nothing i found an old gator that ended up like you know for your legs and i ended up uh like wiping my butt with it you know when i had to go to the bathroom that was my my toilet paper so that was about the only thing i could use it for Mm -hmm. that was it yeah just the way the the wind and the current worked on that part of the lake, man. It was uh some of the people, some of the contestants were a little bit closer to maybe the lodge. Oh, okay, and so and some of the others were just further away. But yeah, it had to do with the currents and stuff. But it was legitimately a place that people don't go. So, what was the greatest strength or asset of the area that you had? Greatest strength or asset of the area? Well, like. You know, did you have a bunch of big game? Was the fishing really good? Um, did you have a bunch of rabbits? Like, what what was you know the best thing about your spot? I'll tell. You, okay, so the the best. Oh man, I'll tell you the worst thing was definitely the firewood. There's not a lot of dead firewood where, or dead wood where I was at, but there was a lot of wildlife. Um, in the beginning, you know, I, I shot my first squirrel day two, and I'm not really worried about food at this point. Um, I just wanted to get my gill net made, my shelter up. By day five, I had my gill net in the water, day five. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, you know, you got to see from the show that I caught a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't have asked for a better fishing spot. So I think for me, one of the, you know, the luck things that I got was having such an amazing fishing hole, um, the right type of water for putting for placing a gill net. Not everybody had that. I didn't have any moose in my area, but... That's not to say that they weren't going to move into my area later, right? Didn't have any muskox in my area, but it's not to say they weren't going to move in. Right. Um, I did have a lot of bear. Mm-hmm. So I had a lot, and I was super happy about that because, you know, the the two bear that I've taken in my life, I've taken with a bow. Um, and I was like, all right, well, I want to take one with a traditional bow now, right? Getting all excited. And mm-hmm. um, I love black bear hunting, but I had a lot of bear. Didn't have any rabbits starting off from what I thought. I was like, oh, there's no rabbits in here. Now there's fox. I could see fox everywhere, but it wasn't until the snow hit, the first snow, that I was like, ooh, rabbit tracks, set a snare. Yeah. Um, and I was able to set a snare, and I trapped that one rabbit, and I was like looking for more tracks. And I'm like, there are none. I'm like, ah. It wasn't until about day 30 that I really started, uh, and, and another snow came, and on my way to check my gill, I noticed, okay, there's rabbits in this area. So it was... It was there was a lot of wildlife out there, but you had to stay out there long enough to find it. Right. Find, you know, long enough to figure out what their routine was. And really when you become like, you're becoming one with that land because mm-hmm. you're out there every single day. Um, and it's like with hunting. If you think you're going to go out there and be successful on the first day, like you might be, but that's luck. Like, you yeah. know, like you're going to have to go out there and put in the hard work and really become one with what you're doing out there. And I'm not trying to get all hippie on you, but like, there's a little, uh, there's a little to be said about, um, going out there and embracing yourself and your environment and becoming a part of it. Not just, not just taken from it, but adding to it in a sense. Was that a gradual progression or was there a point where you felt like 
I'm in it. Like I'm, I'm a part of it. This is working. I think I felt like that from the very second I went out there. From the second they dropped me off the helicopter, I was like, oh, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm part of this environment now. Um, and things, luckily for me, things were actually, they went extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the fact that I had so much fish allowed me to explore more. It allowed me to have confidence. It allowed me to do things in my shelter. It allowed me to build knickknacks. Um, because really when you're out there, you're worried about fire, water, food, right? Fire, water, food, shelter. Um, fire is pretty easy if you have a ferro rod and we've got to let the birch bark and stuff around there. Pretty easy to light a fire. So then it's like, okay, water. Well, water's right there at the lake. You got a, can't, you got a two quart pot, you can boil it. So you're set on those two. Shelter, if you build it in time. Um, I know, you know, a lot of people gave Joe a lot of, uh, flack for not having a shelter up, but you know, Joe, Joe was one of the guys that didn't have his shelter by what was the day 40 or something like that, or 44 is the same. He tapped on the same day I did, but that was one of the main re and I mean, Joe was doing an amazing job on his shelter. He's a perfectionist and he was building something immaculate. Um, but for me, I was like, ah, I just need to build something big and something that I can be comfortable in like a house. Um, something that'll also keep me warm. So I had that done by day 10. But I was also catching fish with a means of I didn't have to be there. Right. right? Um, by day by day six, I was bringing two in a day, so I was kind of lucky with that. But yeah, the area had a lot of lot of wildlife, um, just a ton of it. Now, did you ever get a shot at a bear? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I I got to think about how I got to answer this, but uh. Yeah, I did. I, I I had a couple different encounters with bear. The first one was right around day 10, and it was not successful, right? Um, took a shot off on a bear uh, with my bow, and it hit high. Mm -hmm. And this is something that, like, obviously they're not going to showcase because they right. don't want to show that. And honestly, it wasn't uh, – I hadn't had the cameras rolling anyways. Yeah, I was down here building a knickknack or whatever the heck I was building, something for the, the shelter – and uh, this bear's just sitting on this rock, looking down at my shelter. I look up, make some kind of grunt noise. I'm like, what the heck is that? Look up. I'm like, oh, man, I got to go to my shelter, get my bow, come back, and, you know, try and get a shot off from this guy. And he was coming down towards me the same time I was going up towards him. But, you know, I saw that arrow go in, and it hit right in the sweet spot, above his lungs, below his spine. I was like, this bear's going to be fine. And I, he hit it, and instantly I go, damn it, that was high. Yeah. Right? So... And I am very fortunate because I, you know, that bear 1,000% lived. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, I spent about, I still spent about six hours attempting to track it because I really would have, you know, I was like, maybe it nicked the lung. But no, there's none of that happening. Um, but I'm fortunate that I didn't take that bear because day 10, it, the temperatures weren't cold enough to, for, I would have had to have preserved all that meat. Right. And there's no way I was going to be able to preserve that much meat um, and that amount of time, a lot of it would have spoiled. Um, no matter how thin I cut those strips and tried to smoke that meat, um, there was just no preserving it. it was, the temperatures were too warm. So it wasn't until about day 30 that if you were to take an animal while I was out there, it needed to be at least day 30. Roland was able to get that musk ock ar around that time. Perfect mm -hmm. time to take a large game because it's right in the beginning, kind of, uh, yeah. towards that venture. And uh, at the same time, you don't have to do too much work for preserving. It's all frozen. So, um, but yeah, I did, I was able to get a shot off on a bear. Um, wasn't successful with it. And, you know, it's one of those things you look back at and you're like, uh, but I had already been in a pretty bad way already from something else that I ate by day 10. Hmm. So I am super lucky. I didn't kill that bear. Cause you know, it's just been a waste of food. Right. So trichinosis, yeah, that's the thing. Scary, <laughs> scary stuff. Yeah, so, you know, I'd heard of trichinosis before and not like, not big. I'd heard of it uh, from bears, right? You know, mm -hmm. bear hunting, you're like, hey, make sure you cook that bear meat good. I usually heard that, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not anymore, but like I've heard, okay, spring bears, you really got to check or a little bit worse than um, fall bears. And I'm like, 
I'm thinking about that now, and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. If it has trichinosis, it has trichinosis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in that meat. It doesn't matter if it's a spring bear or a fall bear. But, you know, I had my first signs of not doing too good on, on day 10, uh, around day 10. And that's so when, what is the incubation period on trichinosis? Like, I mean, did you probably consume those worms, like, really soon, like day two so, or three? Um, no, it had to have been – at least day five. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's not in squirrels. It has to be from a meat-eating animal. And I didn't think it was in fish. So when I'm cooking my, my trout, I'm cooking it like salmon, right? And, I mean, these are essentially salmon, these huge lake trout. And I'm cooking it like probably 140 degrees. It's succulent. I'm cooking it on a rock. I mean, this is this is living. I was living out there, right? Mm-hmm. I was also smoking a lot of it and drying it. Well, when you dry it, you only get to about 110 degrees. Right. And so I had no worries in the world because a lot of people eat raw fish, mm-hmm. right? Um, especially salmon will eat it. Um, they'll eat it raw, a lot of people. But around day 10, I started having diarrhea, like a, in my sleeping bag, like completely ruined my sleeping bag. Bad deal. Oh, man, it was bad. Yeah, I woke up at 1 in the morning. I was like, oh, what just happened? I had to climb out, go crawl down to a lake that was cold rinse off, start a fire, trying to get warm again. I mean, it was, it was an all night event, obviously. And then cleaning that thing out was just horrendous, but I thought it was from all the fish I was eating. So by t- day 10, I was eating, I was catch two, three or four fish a day. And was, these are big fish we're talking. So I had a lot of fish oils, a lot of fish fat in my diet. And that's pretty much all it was. So I thought to myself, man, I need to start eating some reindeer moss. I need to start throwing some fiber in my diet. So I did. And it worked. It started plugging me up for about three days because prior to that I was going to the bathroom twice a day and it was just brown liquid coming out of me. Hmm. So it wasn't until uh, in the twenties, my vision started going a little bit and I'm like, Oh, that's weird. I must not have the right nutrients, right. the right vitamins, whatever. By day 35, that's when it hit me of like, okay, here's another sign and symptom. And I didn't even know this at the time. But day thirty, day thirty four, I went on a hike looking for moose. I pushed as far inland as I could push. Um, there was snow, so I could I could look for moose tracks cutting east to west. I can and I hiked back the opposite way looking for moose tracks north to south. I didn't see any moose tracks, right? So I came back on day thirty five. I remember that night, I only slept about one hour, and from that night until day forty four, I'd still only sleep an hour. And uh, yeah, so I had. Um, I could only sleep on my my back. I couldn't sleep on my side. I'm a side sleeper. Well, it turns out I couldn't breathe when I was on my side, and I was just tired. I mean, day 35, I was exhausted. And your heart wasn't working right. And and I didn't know this though, so I just thought I was being a little weak weakling. And uh, and I'm out there, and I'm like, all right, uh, get it together, Mark. Right, like start finding some other stuff to eat because obviously all this fish isn't good. It's like the best diet you could have out there, right? right. Uh, Day 44 was the day that I decided to call it. I knew I was just digressing. And day 40, when my shelter caught on fire and I put it out, I was like a, you know, it got me amped up. I was excited. Mm-hmm. I was like, hell yeah. I put the fire out. <laughs> like, yeah. Even though it caught on fire, I was still happy I was able to put it out. I rebuilt it, had a positive attitude. And then day 42, the end of day 41, day 42, I mean, it was just plummeted straight back down and it got even worse. And, I decided to tap because I knew I couldn't sustain this. Mm-hmm. and um, But I didn't even know something was medically wrong with me. I came out of the field, had a fever of 104, blah, blah, blah. Went to some doctors uh, in the hospital. It wasn't until I actually got back to America, the United States of Freedom, and I got back here and realized how bad a condition I was in. In Canada, they knew that I had a parasite of some type. It was either typhoid tularemia or trichinosis. They started treating me there for that, but they didn't check my heart or my brain, but they did check my liver, my spleen, my lungs. And it turns out I had a fluid behind my right lung. Um, I had my liver and my spleen were infected and enlarged. Um, And so this parasite had gotten to my organs and I'm like, oh, okay, well, whatever. Let's just Mm -hmm. get it out of my body and we'll be fine. When I got to the States, I went to the VA. They're like immediately rushed me back there and they're like, Hey, your heart's in the condition of an 87-year-old man just had a massive heart attack. I was like, what? Uh, 
And Oddly specific. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, <laughs> your troponin levels are like through the roof right now. We need to see if they're on the rise or if they're coming down. Like, whatever this parasite is, it's gotten to your heart. Mm-hmm. And that's when I realized, like, the severity of what I got myself into. And I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily like, even whenever I decide to tap, I was okay with it. Now, the whole point of me going and doing this show was to not quit. I didn't care if I got a million dollars. I didn't care if I made it to 100 days. I just wanted to go and not quit. I wanted to be able to show my son, hey, do something tough and just don't quit. It's okay to fail. It's perfectly fine to get pulled for starving or get to, I mean, no one wants that. But, like, I just didn't want to quit. Mm -hmm. And when I ended up quitting, for some odd reason, I was okay with it. I remember they asked me, like, what are you going to say to all the recon marines and scout snipers out there that you were doing this for? And I was like, uh you make it 44 days out there and then we'll talk <laughs> like, right. Yeah. But I was like, I'm just joking. Nah, I did, I did feel uh, slightly guilty. And there is still this slight sense of guilt, even though if I would have stayed out there, I would have died. Mm-hmm. Uh, trichinosis goes from, it's not that bad and it'll pass through your body to, it'll kill you in four to six weeks. And the path I was on was 1000% that it'll kill you in four to six weeks. Um, when it goes all your organs, especially your heart, it'll just completely make your heart shut down. And so, yeah, you know, I was out there and I, I was in the VA hospital and the third day I attempted to leave. I was like, hey, doc, what do you think about me going home and resting and coming back every day? And he's like, sit the fuck down. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, if you would let me, he's like, I wasn't trying to scare you before and I don't want to scare you. But if you would have stayed out there for one to two more days longer, there's a very good chance you could have just died out there. Your heart just getting completely stopped on. You. I was like, that's the moment that I realized like, wow, like know your body be able to push your body and train in as many situations you can, but at the same time, listen to your body. Because if I was to go out there and just be stubborn, like my son wouldn't have a dad to raise him. Mm -hmm. And so this whole thing was doing it for my son. But if I would have like killed myself over something ridiculous, like trichinosis that I didn't even know was going on with my body, that's just not worth it. Right. Right. So, you know, that was, that was the biggest thing I took away from this is push your body in as many ways as possible and push it hard, but also learn from those ways and know when enough is enough and know what hard is. Because what I referenced was, man, I've done a lot of hard things in the Marine Corps with the scout sniper community, with the recon community, with operating, with, with even hunts. And this is 12,000 times harder than any of that. Why? I am eating so well. Mm-hmm. So I knew something wasn't right. Uh, but I didn't know I was sick. I just knew something's not right. Maybe it was my diet. So I, you know, I decided to tap, but yeah, trichinosis, man, that thing put me, put me out of the fight until uh, about February. Wow. I was cleared, um, cleared. My heart was, wasn't going to have any swelling or uh permanent damage about February. And I left, uh, October 31st on Halloween. Hmm. So, well, I'm glad that you pulled the shoot when you did. Yeah, man. So I, mean, I do too. Uh, me too. i uh, pretty, <laughs> pretty happy with, uh, making it 44 days. Unfortunately I got trichinosis, but at the same time, such a learning experience to be able to to go through that. Like any lasting effects, like what's the afterglow? Are are you girl? Girls don't want to date me because they think I have worms. (laughs) 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 Like, like, uh, so these worms stay in your body. Yeah. Up. And I I don't even know like what the reality of it is, but like some people are saying up to 10 years. Wow. Um, and these worms, so they get a calcium deposit forms around them. So, the good news is, is that if the apocalypse happens, nobody wants to eat me because, like, you will get trichinosis. So I'm slightly infected. But, mm-hmm. you know, now there, there's no long-term effects. I was able to keep working out, uh, started working out and really getting my heart back in shape about March uh, of 2020. But what about know. good stuff? Like, is there a, is is there anything that this experience changed for you as a person that you feel like has made your life better? Not As, trichinosis necessarily. Yeah. But. You know, uh, I think I'm a little bit more open-minded towards certain individuals. Mm-hmm. I went out there not knowing how I was going to act being by myself. Mm-hmm. I was like, man, I've done, I've done some hard things, but I've never been by myself. Like, am I going to break down? Am I going to like, what am I going to do? What's going to happen? And I was extremely happy that I was happy. I was having a good time. I was having fun while I was out there. So that was eye opening and, and really rewarding. The what I was talking about earlier with uh being a little bit more open minded, like I was pretty open minded 
before going on this show, but then being able to hang out with people like Callie, Joel, Kai, uh, Sean, every, all of these different people with different backgrounds, Amos, like way different than me, right? Mm-hmm. A- me and Amos are pretty different. Right. But we're so similar in a lot of ways too. And being able to hang out with them, they're just tough people. And that's what I'm attracted to is tough individuals, right? People that go out there and um, they work hard, you know, they, they've they been through things. They're willing to put it all on the line. And it was just such an awesome group of people that uh, you would, I don't know, you know, we were used to the military mindset and the military, oh, you did this, oh, you're badass, you know, you got to do the special operation of this or that or um, infantry or whatever. And you, you get out and you realize like, no. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be have zero survival experience, in my opinion, it's personal opinion. You could go out there with zero survival experience, but the right mindset and be successful on that show. Um, if you could keep that mindset. If you can keep that mindset and if you can adapt and improvise, because I was learning the whole time I was out there. I was like, okay, damn, I got to fix this gill net, right? Mm-hmm. That's the first time I was ever actually legally allowed to use a gill net. Right. Um, so, and I'm catching fish with it. Well, same thing with the trapping. Same thing with how about like uh, preserving fish? Like I'd never preserved that much fish before. So I'm out there on the fly, like figuring out how to cut uh, thin slices on these things and be able to, you know, put them all over the fire at once. But so as long as you can adapt and have the right mindset, I mean, anybody can go out there and do stuff like that. And anybody can survive, right? So that's the most realistic survival show there is, is alone. Mm-hmm. Because you may very well may find yourself with, Limited amount of items, stuck somewhere, stranded, no communications, and you have to start providing food for yourself until somebody comes. So, well, I applaud you for doing it. Um, wildly entertaining, and <laughs> uh, and it's motivating. It it really is, and I think it it speaks to people in in a lot of different ways. But you know, that's that's how we used to live for yeah. a long, long time. The simple life. Yeah, I, I, dude, it did. It made me realize like how appreciative I was of everything. And I still am to this day, toilet paper, a toilet, like something to sit on, like, like rice spices, everything is like, man, we take her for granted so many things in life and life's not meant to be that difficult. And, uh, so, you know, uh, just the simplicities and what has really given me, um, amazing experience. And I, you know, I kind of, if 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 you can go out there and do this, just spend five days in the woods by yourself, you'll come out a better person. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, even less. Yeah. Um, but if you can make it five days, you're gonna learn something about yourself that maybe you knew but had forgotten or hadn't realized for sure. If people want to find out more about you, or if they want to attend one of your shooting schools, how how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, go on my website, um, intsurvival.com. Um, we got some courses on there. It's also got Branded Rock Canyon on there as the luxury option. So for the individuals who are going to those expensive Marco Polo hunts or Ibex hunts um, or any type of hunts that you want to be more prepared for, mm-hmm. um, they can come here, and we can uh, put them through one of those courses. But INT Survival, uh, Instagram is Shoot Hunt Survive. You'll find links to all this stuff in the podcast description. Mark, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for showing me around this ranch. This is awesome. I hope we can do more out here together. And uh, you've got uh, a few other things that are exciting that are coming up that we'll keep keep people abreast of as they develop. Can't talk about them too much right now. But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited for your future, and it's fun getting to hang out with you and talk about this stuff. Yeah, man, it's awesome. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. This episode was edited by Emily Brannigan, with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Artwork for the Six Ranch podcast was created by John Chatterlin and digitized by Celia Christofferson. If you enjoyed the show, I encourage you to share it with a friend and subscribe. You can find photos and more content on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.